Good evening. From the European Parliament here in Brussels, it's been a very busy week as world leaders descended into town for several high-level summits. Plus, we had an exclusive interview with the Russian Prime Minister in Moscow. All of that and all of the highlights coming your way in case you missed it. As the EU Council summit wraps up, it appears that the only thing both sides were able to achieve when it came to Brexit was disappointment. Well, Theresa May reportedly offered no new ideas in her speech last night, and the uh, remaining 27 leaders wrapped up the following debate unusually early. All right, well, let's uh, cross over now to our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. With all the latest updates, you're joining us, Darren, from the European Council headquarters. Give us the latest as, we, as, as the summit wraps pretty early. Yeah, well, as you said, this EU Council uh, meeting, or the initial part of it at least, is uh, wrapping up. And we've heard from, what, the German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel this afternoon, uh, in which she, I think, kind of sums up actually how the EU Council went in regards to Brexit. She said that she left at uh, last night's dinner neither more pessimistic nor more optimistic. And I think in many regards that does sum up uh, the mood of this uh, EU Council uh, meeting. Uh, not least of all because, yes, you're right, there has uh, been no substantive progress. Uh, that was the conclusion of the EU 27 uh, last night. No new ideas from Theresa May, but everyone is committed to carrying on negotiating on the issue of Brexit. Now, there is potentially uh, a little bit of progress uh, this afternoon that could be quite significant. Uh, that is that the European Union uh, suggestions from Irish sources could be open to the, uh, this so-called backstop, which is meant to avoid a hard border in Northern Ireland, and at the moment is only meant to apply to Northern Ireland, could be UK-wide. Now, that could be a benefit uh, or a win for Theresa May in these negotiations, though it is possible it will not be received back in Britain by many uh, as a win. So let's get the view uh, on this and many others with uh, Ben Glaze. He's the political, deputy political editor of the, uh, of the Mirror newspaper in the UK. Um, first of all, if this is true that Theresa May is, has been able to get some type of guarantee on a UK-wide backstop, um, how much of a win is that for her? And how is it like to be received? It would be a minor victory. This, this summit had been set up as a crucial moment. There was a lot of pressure on leaders, and particularly Theresa May, to come here and get some sort of an agreement. You know, the damp squib that um, we all feared this might turn into, it largely has. Um, she, if she does get something out of the Irish, being able to take that back to the UK, she can, she's got sh something to show when she addresses the House of Commons on Monday, a little bit of progress, but it's not really yet unlocked the talks. It's not broken that deadlock that's been so crucial, which has overshadowed the last few summits, really. Uh, one of the things we also learned today, apparently, is that May is willing to uh, extend the transition period. But again, that's gone down a bit like a cup of coal sick uh, in London with Brexiteers. It's the worst thing in the world she could have done, really. She's, you know, she's fighting on several fronts back home. The Remainers feel she's given um, too much away um, or, and also trying to deny them the meaningful vote when there is a vote on any deal. But the Brexiteers, they're up in arms about this. It ties Britain, shackles Britain to Brussels for up to a year longer. Now, sources are telling us it might only be a few months, and the indication is that Britain needed to show some sort of compromise um, from its side. But so far, it's not been enough, and it, it really does place her in an, an, an unviable position amongst the, the hard right of the Conservatives and the DUP as well, on whose vote she relies in the Commons. All right, I will go first to you, Sajid, being our British MEP here. I mean, was Theresa May, she was here physically, but was she actually talking to her uh, audience back home? I think both. Uh, and she had a very delicate balancing act uh, to carry out. She had to, of course, engage with the negotiating counterparts as well as fellow EU leaders. But at the same time, she has a very tough ask of keeping her party united behind her, which isn't, and trying to gain some sort of uh, compromise within the House of Commons that doesn't exist at the moment either. All right, before we uh, continue that discussion, I would like to bring in uh, uh, a soundbite from Theresa May herself and the Lithuanian uh, leader. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I believe everybody around the table wants to get a deal by working intensively and closely. I believe a deal is achievable and now is the time to make it happen. Today, we do not know what they want. They, know, they do not know themselves what they really want. That's a problem. We took uh, steps. We need to, to know what another side wants finally. It is still a great secret. 
Well, there you go, Pauline. Uh, uh, Theresa May being a little bit optimistic there, and you have uh, the Lithuanian leader saying, "Well, actually, we don't know what they want." <laughs> so, w what's your reading? Um, well, on the EU side, it's very clear that they want to work with with the Brits. They want to find a deal. They're very clear on that. But they've also been saying quite clearly that there hasn't been any progress, and therefore, I mean, the Lithuanian, Lithuanian president is just saying it a bit, a bit more obviously, um, how. Basically, they're waiting for the UK to make a choice, and the UK is not quite sure what it wants. Is it that? Is it not knowing what they want? I'll put it to you, Peter. Is it not knowing what they want, or should Theresa May come here with what the EU wants, and then we can move forward? Well, what we are seeing now is a kind of power game. It's like a poker game. Everyone is raising the stakes all the time. I'm not very worried about this. Uh, this will end, I think, in a deal. But as all uh, responsible politicians, of course, it's always good to bear in mind also to, to make plans for uh, possibly a no deal. But I'm quite sure we will see a deal develop in December. Yeah, Sergeant, is that true, though, that the UK does not know what it wants? Well, um, parts of our debate in the UK really have got to a ridiculous stage where almost people are saying, we have a union, it's called the United Kingdom. If you want to join that, then all you have to do is ask to join the pound and swear allegiance to the Queen. You know, mm. parts of the debate have become so ridiculous. But on the serious side of it, I have no doubt we will get a deal between the European Union and Theresa May. But can we get that deal through the House of Commons in the United Kingdom? That is the golden question. At this moment in time, there is no majority for any form of deal to be put to the House of Commons, and neither is there a majority in the House of Commons for a no deal so the scenario answer is no either. To your question, the answer is no. So we're back to square one, actually. Well, ultimately, at the second hurdle, we could find that whatever deal is agreed here in Brussels, it actually falls in London. Exactly. That's a risk. I, I completely agree. I think there's as long, and now Theresa May is also with this proposal to just get a longer transition is actually getting in, in even bigger dan danger because mm. people now in London or the Brexiteers kind of want to get rid of her as they keep saying every few weeks but still it's she said so now she's in dan danger and there's this deal that's not even done that may even never yeah, so pass we, parliament yeah with, with, with all of this uh, we, we saw some leaders you know they, they're preparing for uh, a no deal brexit there's a lot of talk about whether or not that would actually take place but there are preparations going on german chancellor angela merkel said yesterday that it is of course part of uh, being responsible and forward-looking governance that they we prepare for all scenarios that includes a possibility that britain will leave the eu without a deal it's probably her first time actually acknowledging that. And France has published a draft bill in the case of a no deal. A British citizens would have to present visas to enter French territory and hold residence permits to stay. And they could not hold jobs restricted to EU nationals. They would also have limited access to health care and welfare. I mean, that is pretty specific and pretty, pretty hard, actually, putting that on the table. Um, is this really something that is envisioned or do you think it's a negotiating tactic? Putting pressure. No, I think it's a negotiating tactics now. You are all the time raising the stakes. And uh, it, like I said, it's like a poker game. You increase and increase uh, into to the, the, the pot all the time. But eventually uh, there will be a deal here. But uh, before they actually have a deal on the table, I don't think we will see it here in the different interviews with the different leaderships. But Pauline, let's look at it from the French point of view. If there is no deal, wouldn't they benefit from it by trying to win? You know, there are some analysts who would say that they, would, they could try to win some of the business that would probably leave the UK and, and benefit from it. Right. Um, well, I think there's, there's obviously um, some part of like business and finance that Macron's being very open to, to try and, and, and call to, to, to France. Like he's, he's called for entrepreneurs to, to come to France. It's, it's not new that he would want to try and get some benefit from it. The EU leaders will sit down tonight to dinner, but Theresa May won't be there. And as has been widely reported, she's not invited to that dinner. And strangely enough, it's not the first time that food has threatened to overshadow these negotiations. Let's take a look. They called it the Pizza Summit. Members of May's cabinet met for a pizza party on Monday evening. And while May was not there, concerns over her Brexit strategy were definitely on the menu. It's not the first time food has taken centre stage. As you mentioned briefly the, the dinner you had with Mrs May. Publicly it was a good dinner. Privately I, I heard it wasn't quite so good. Uh, and do you expect... You mean the quality of the food or...? <laughs> Privately everything went well, but in fact we have a problem. 
because the British want to leave the European Union and it's not feasible. But it was excellent. I'm not talking about the food. <laughs> or what about when a Brexit-dominated summit made Angela Merkel hungry for a famed Brussels fruit shop? Or when Council President Donald Tusk posted this photo of Theresa May and a not-so-subtle caption, sorry, no cherries. What is this with the obsession with food? Anybody want to comment on that? Food is important. <laughs> You're from Modena. It's You're, the center yes, of gastronomy uh, in Italy. Absolutely. That's how we come together. That's how exactly. we make connections and no, relationships. Food is absolutely and not right. being invited right. to dinner, you know, it's such a big deal. Food exactly. here, it, it says a exactly. lot, right? Food brings people together. <laughs> but does. do we it care does. what they <laughs> eat? I don't care I what don't they eat. It's <laughs> about the real, what they're talking about. That's the real sad thing table. about where the UK is right now. Mm -hmm. The UK is literally not at the table, not part of the family. Well, there you go. That's a tragedy. Traditional parties in the EU are doing some serious reflecting today after voters sent a clear message over the weekend that in Germany, Luxembourg and Belgium, uh, those traditional parties suffered major losses and erosion of support as voters turned to the fringes. The biggest shakeup was in Bavaria, where preliminary results showed that the ruling Christian Social Union won the most votes but lost its absolute majority. For only the third time since the Second World War, it will have to share power. The far-right anti-immigration alternative for German party is projected to enter state parliament for the first time. While the Green Party were the real success story, more than doubling its support to become the second largest political force in southern Germany. Uh, this afternoon, we heard from Angela Merkel, who struck a conciliatory tone, declaring that lessons have to be learned. Let's have a listen. And deshalb ist meine Lehre aus dem gestrigen Tag dass ich auch als Bundeskanzlerin dieser Großen Koalition stärker dafür Sorge tragen muss, dass dieses Vertrauen da ist und damit auch die Resultate unserer Arbeit sichtbar werden. Und das werde ich auch mit allem Nachdruck tun. Uh, Angela Merkel speaking a, a little earlier on. Brian, let's start with you. Um, just kind of sum up what we take away from this election. The result was expected, but it's still... Pretty big news, isn't it? It's big news if you look at what's happened in terms of individual parties. But when you look at left-right blocks, not much changed. Uh, when you, you add together the numbers in terms of who shifted where, there really is very little movement there. And this is going to be very interesting for the European elections as well, because we do expect that no one party is going to dominate next time. But Bavaria teaches us that there's a lot of coalition building still to be done. There is one party, though, that's taken a very significant uh, hit, the SDP. Um, why? It's, it's difficult to say, but what we can, what we can say is that uh, there is a risk factor within this government. This is clearly the CSU. From the beginning on, they tried to do their own uh, policy, they to do their own issues. And that was mainly linked to the election yesterday in Bavarian, uh, Bavarian elections. And we know that the CSU is everything doing for these kind of irregional elections every five years. This, that's the reason why I'm telling that this is a risk factor. And now this risk factor, um, they, they brought it so far with the disputes in the last month, um, in particular of this, um, uh, we call it Bundesverfassungsschutz, the protection uh, of, the, of the Constitution, the chief of this, uh, of this authority. And this was, I guess, one more important um, uh, um, instance for, for, for the problem. Well, there are definitely internal uh, pressures and disputes within uh, the SDP in Bavaria. But that's not to say that obviously this is also part of a wider trend that we've seen uh, where right, the SDP right. essentially I, I, getting hammers. Yes, I don't want to say that this is the only, only reason for our failure. To be honest, we have, we have um, a lack of uh, credibility for a long time now. And uh, this is directed... <laughs> This is directly dealing and, and linked to the Grand Coalition issues. And as we might remember, one year ago we had uh, the big question to answer, should we go once again into the Grand Coalition or not? And we, had, uh, we asked the, the members and they said with 67% mm -hmm. or let's go. So that that's makes our life uh, really difficult. Uh, being the junior partner in government uh, isn't necessarily always, always good. But let's have a look. Uh, let's take a closer look at those results uh, from uh, last night's uh, election. This is uh, according to preliminary polls uh, that the uh, CSU, uh, it still topped that poll. It won 37.2% of the vote, but that was down massively 10 percentage points from the last election. Uh, now, it could form a coalition 
with the Conservative Free Voters. Uh, they're predicted to take 11.6%. Uh, support surged for non-traditional parties, as we've been saying. The Greens are predicted to win, what, 17.5%, and the AFD 10.5%, knocking over that 10% figure. We should say uh, the SDP polled uh, less than 10% of the result. We, we've just heard from Angela Merkel, talked about making a conciliatory noises. What's the, what's the damage for her and for, uh, for her governing party in Berlin? Well, time will tell. I mean, she's definitely taking a calm and collective stance, as we saw her speak there. That's always the way Angela Merkel goes. And a real litmus test, of course, for her will be on the 28th of October when we see the Hessen state elections. That's, of course, the economic powerhouse of Germany where Frankfurt is based. And all eyes will be, will be on those elections, of course, to see uh, what happens then. Bavarian elections were, of course, huge for the last... Uh, four or five decades, we've seen uh, her sister party do extremely well, but this result has just showed that people just are not voting for the moderate regular politicians anymore, if you like. They're looking uh, and for... We, and we look at what? We look at Luxembourg over the weekend. This is a general trend where particularly the centre-left is not performing at all. I mean, it's it, almost, you could say, the collapse of the centre-left right across Europe. The centre-left has copied other people to follow on migration. It's pitched here, it's pitched there, it's lost credibility, uh, like uh, you just heard. And the, some Greens I spoke with uh, today from Germany, they said they were mopping up uh, socialist votes uh, because they have no credibility left. They said that this was uh, an election about what they called Haltung, uh, probably mispronounced, but ethics and principles. Uh, CSU lost on ethics and principles, and they said that uh, the socialists just seemed irrelevant in this. I don't know if that can continue, though. Is, it, is this in some ways quite good for Angela Merkel, though, in the so. sense that it means that her arguments about tacking to the right, um, which some would say the CSU did, has not worked? Yeah, if you look at it from that perspective, yes. But we have to look generally when it comes to democracy. I think it's, it's not a good a sign and a good, a good signal when we look around and the democratic parties are losing because of these kind of things. We are, we are also faced uh, with these migration issues. But the main problem is when, when you allow uh, that we have the modes for the last 10, 12 years, always crisis mode. The people, they had... The, the crisis on, on Greece, they had the crisis on, on the budget what, of the nation. While domestically yeah. doing quite well, though. You know, the economy's doing well, look, but, but crime the people, is down. If you look from that perspective, you are right. Uh, it's far more difficult to justify, to, to explain, because the people, if you look around, they earn... They have never earned so much money as now. The situation we have in Bavaria, for example, we have 2.8 unemployment. That does mean this is nearly full employment. Full employment yeah. So this is really a schizophrenic situation. But as you said before, we as social democrats all over the European Union, we have to create ourselves in a new way. We have to come with different uh, political uh, offers. For example, a European industry policy, which is uh, none of the parties are doing so far. <laughs>Embarrassed by that reaction? Do you think it damaged Russia's credibility? <clears throat> Понимаете, вообще любые оценки такого порядка, они точно не способствуют международному сотрудничеству. Я вспоминаю советский период, когда Советский Союз тоже вешал герлыки 
клеймил международную систему капитала, говорил о том, значит, что нас разделяет. Но ни к чему хорошему это не вело. Мы еще сегодня не говорили про наших друзей за океаном, например, про вот эту антироссийскую истерию, которая существует в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Мы же прекрасно понимаем, что все, что связано с Россией сейчас в Соединенных Штатах Америки, преследует другую цель. Это, это внутри политические разборки. По сути, разборки между республиканцами и демократами, разборки внутри республиканской партии. То же самое, я почему об этом говорю, касается европейских стран. Значит, вот эта антироссийская кампания, она в там, 90% из 100 преследует абсолютно внутриполитические цели. Сохраниться у власти, сформировать правительство, добиться еще каких-то результатов. Но уж точно не, так сказать, повлиять на позицию России. На нее повлиять невозможно, все это прекрасно понимают. Я не знаю, я это комментировать не буду, просто потому что я не знаком ни с этими людьми, ни с этими комментариями в достаточной степени не знаком. Я не знаю, откуда я знаю. Okay. So does Russia see itself at war with America or anyone? Санкции абсолютно непродуктивная история. А санкции в отношении банковского сектора, это действительно объявление торговой войны, это наиболее тяжелые санкции. Нет никаких сомнений, что мы подобного рода давление сможем преодолеть. У нас нет никаких сомнений, что наша экономика способна адаптироваться к любым формам давления. Вопрос только в том, зачем это надо. Вопрос именно в том, что это разрушает международный порядок, в том числе международный экономический порядок. Степень интегрированности, взаимовлеченности российской и американской экономики очень незначительная. От того, что американцы объявляют санкции в отношении, допустим, нашей страны, американский бизнес не очень сильно страдает. А именно потому, что у нас небольшой объем объем торгового оборота. Но европейский бизнес страдает очень сильно, потому что у нас огромный объем торгового оборота. Торговый оборот с Соединенными Штатами Америки приблизительно сейчас это плохой период, около 20 миллиардов долларов. Это ничто. 45% нашего торгового оборота приходится на Европейский Союз. Это сотни миллиардов евро. Возникает вопрос, что на этом потеряла Европа? А потеряла она рабочие места, потеряла она прибыль, потеряла... Уверенность. Дональда Трампа не мы убирали. Его, с одной стороны, подозревают в каких-то симпатиях в нашей стране, хотя, собственно говоря, он ничего с точки зрения такого радикального улучшения отношений между нашими странами пока не сделал. Is there, maybe I'll start with you, is there, is that, is that the view in Russia? Is there Russian, anti-Russian hysteria? You're living here in Europe, mm -hmm. you see what the Europeans see as Russia doing and seen as Russian aggression. Is, is there anti-Russia hysteria? Uh, I think the Russian media is reporting anti-Russia hysteria with a bit of excitement because it means for them that Russia is treated as a really powerful, big, uh, almost superpower. Uh, Even if it's America, it means that we are on the same level with the states. So, uh, in a way, it, it boosts their pride. In the same way that, you know, Russia is obsessed with celebrating victory in the Second World War. Because, look, yeah. we beat Germans themselves, so we're really powerful. So, again, it's, I think they're suffering from loss of prestige as a superpower, as a Soviet Union. And now they're back on the stage, on the front row. So, in a way, they're happy to report that... Uh, Although, of course, it hurts their pride as well, because I said, no, we're not, uh, we haven't done enough to deserve this bad treatment. All right. Well, one thing that uh, how Europe has been responding is through sanctions. So sanctions, Mitya Medvedev was saying that regardless of uh, what, how many sanctions is, are imposed, it won't change, change the position of Russia. So it's useless. Well, let me say first that uh, the Russian people are our friends. We reach out to them. It's a great nation, a great people. The problem is in the Kremlin. And it's the Russian people that are the first one to suffer of this uh, regime. Uh, if the sanctions are so futile and terrible as uh, the Prime Minister says, they could start by lifting the sanctions that Russia is imposing to Europe. Because these are the sanctions that are hitting our company, not the ones that we put. We have soft powers in the European Union. We are not a military superpower. It's our economic power. And it's a way to tell the Russian 
Kremlin, um, come back to the international community, come back to us. You're a member of the United Nations, member of the G8, respect international law. But the aggression against Donbass and Luhansk in Ukraine with involvement of Russian military, the annexation of Crimea, an integral part of Ukraine. These are facts. So, you know, we, here we have this propaganda machinery where I'm sorry that the Prime Minister is part of defying and attacking Europe. On the other side, you have, with Cripple, with Ukraine and so on, hard facts, mm. with the fake news, with the attacks against our, our, our election. This is evidence that we have that Russia is acting in a way that is hostile to when, the European Union, I... dividing us, destabilizing us, and trying to disunite us. Yeah. In, and of in, course, sanctions is the minimum we can do. When I presented all those, you know, the, 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 mm. that Europe um, is accusing Russia of, and with the evidence that the Europe intelligence services have, mm. he said, I'm not going to Brussels to meet my counterparts to be judged. We are not here to be judged. So what does that say about No, we're not judging, we're for, defending us right, from attacks. Right, I mean, that's, from him saying that and coming here, what is, what's the potential then to move forward. Well, in his own words, there's no potential because mm -hmm. Russia can't be influenced. So what do you do in that situation? You have to stick to your own values. Uh, the Prime Minister spoke about the importance of international cooperation, but that has to be grounded in something. That has to be grounded in values, not in invading neighboring countries, not in setting up troll farms to disrupt other people's elections, not in murdering the civilians of other countries. And he talked about costs. Well, what is the relative cost? Yes, there's a cost to sanctions, but it's a much greater cost if a country feels that it's going to be invaded or any such invasion would actually occur so obviously, on this European is, territory. This is, this is viewed differently in Russia, obviously, that none of this is accepted. No, sanctions government. work both ways because they're supposed to, they're targeted at oligarchs, at uh, strategic sectors of, of the economy. Exactly. But when uh, they're not supposed to hurt ordinary people in Europe or in Russia. But, when but they Medvedev, are, aren't they? Yes. But, but when Medvedev uh, talk about them hurting uh, people, he talks about Russian counter sanctions, the mm. embargo, in particular, exactly. embargo on, on mm. food imports. Exactly. You know, I've just been to Russia and I met uh, cheesemakers and mm. they produce their own parmigiani mm. and, they, and they're so proud. They said we're busting sanctions, but in a way they're busting counter sanctions. Right. That which, is very important. But that point. means mm. that this is stimulates the Russian economy in a very bizarre way because yeah. they have to the, produce their own. The same with financial sanctions. They are, Russians are worried to keep their accounts right. abroad, so they repatriate the capital, okay. which is good for the yeah, economy. So it's very important to tell to the Italian right. people, for instance, because you mentioned Parmesan, a cup from a family that produced I mean, Parmesan mm. cheese, okay. that it is the sanctions imposed by Russia that are hitting Italian right. producers, not the European sanctions. Yeah. Judging from a video making the rounds on social media, the 2019 European election campaign is off to an aggressive start. Released by the office of the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, the campaign-style ad takes direct aim at Giva Hostat, but it may not be 100% accurate. Alex Morgan and his team at The Cube have been looking into this. Alex, what have you found out? So, Darren, yes, this is the video which accuses Victor or so accuses Giva Hofstadt of being reckless. Now, it also says we must protect Europe and that Hungary, in the statement that accompanies it, does not want to become an immigrant country. So, pretty strong claims focused in on the MEP Giva Hofstadt. And let's just show you the video being released in the English language on social Peter media. Hofstadt. He wants more migration. Uh, we need migration. These are the facts. 1.8 million migrants have entered the European Union since 2015. Millions more wish to come. Since the crisis began, hundreds have lost their lives in vicious attacks all across Europe. Violent crime is rising, and Guy Verhofstadt wants more migration. Uh, we need migration. This is reckless. Time to shake up Brussels. Let's protect Europe. Let's protect Europe. Time to shake up Brussels. And that's quite a short clip you might have noticed there from Giva Hofstadt. Sounds a, bit, sounds a bit clipped, doesn't it? Well, that's because it is. And let me just show you why. That clip from Giva Hofstadt comes from this video from 2014, in which Giva Hofstadt is giving an interview answering the question, is immigration good or bad for Europe? It was part of his candidacy to be a commission president. He actually said, the full sentence he said was this. He says, we need migration. And then he goes on to say, but... We need legal migration. For the moment, we have the opposite. We have illegal migration. 
and human trafficking. The actual point Kiva Hofstadt was making was the need for the European Union to reform its immigration policies to tackle illegal migration. So simply cutting, we need migration without the rest of this clip, that is misleading and that is what this video does. Let's just bring up something else from the video. You'll see a number of these images from the horrific barbaric terrorist attacks across Europe. This video, however, clearly links these attacks to Europe's migration policy since 2015. And the important thing here is that is a gross oversimplification. Attacks like the Bataclan, where indeed uh, many of those attackers were either Belgian or French nationals. And Charlie Hebdo, where those uh, terrorists were radicalised and raised in Paris. To simply link these attacks to immigration policy since 2015, again, is misleading. So let me just bring up that central claim. These are the facts. Well, this video does not present the facts. It misleads people by showing a short clip of Guy Verhofstadt. And look, if I'm going to give my analysis, Darren, on this, this doesn't serve anybody. There is clearly an important discussion to be had in Europe about integration, about assimilation, about radicalization. But videos like this, which don't present the actual situation, that doesn't serve left or right, anti or pro, because at the end of the day, it's easy for critics to dismiss this and shut down the discussion. But in this case, I think many people on both sides would see this video as simply being a piece of political propaganda. <laughs>
yes. investigations into this. Our yeah, our report shows uh, that this is not a marginal phenomenon, as as mentioned in the in the documentary, um, but also it exposes like it it uh, highlights the risks that expose that that this schemes expose the, the the member state, but the EU as a whole, and one of them is the problem of letting some corrupt people in because little checks, little controls are made but on applicants. Se, is it a problem per se because it, there is a financial incentive, and you know if you argue from the financial point of well, view, well, drugs it, will bring your financial uh, results. So you don't see any <laughs> any benefit to this. No, and of course not. I mean, Europe is supposed to be a union of sophisticated economies, not economies that make their money from pumping oil out of the ground around and sitting back doing nothing. This is not what we pride ourselves on. President Donald Trump, he's had a lot to say about Europe uh, last night, and not much of it was flattering. The US president gave a wide-ranging interview to CBS's 60 Minutes. He talked about trade tensions with Europe, NATO, and Russia's alleged poisoning of a former spy. Let's have a look. What's Nobody it? treats us much worse than the European Union. The European Union was formed in order to take advantage of us on trade. And that's what they've done. But this is hostile. And yet they, it's not hostile. It sounds hostile. You know what's hostile? The way they treat us. I like NATO. NATO's fine. But you know what? We shouldn't be paying almost the entire cost of NATO to protect Europe. And then on top of that, they take advantage of us on trade. I will always be there with NATO. But they have to pay their way. I'm fully in favor of NATO, but I don't want to be taken advantage of. Do you agree that Vladimir Putin is involved in assassinations, in poisonings? Probably he is, yeah. Probably. I mean, I don't Probably? Do, do, probably, but I rely on them. It's not in our country. Okay. So, guys, what I find interesting about this is that Donald Trump is at least consistent. He said exactly the same thing for the last couple of years. But he has not been president for two years. Let's look at this. On Europe and trade, they essentially got a deal. On NATO, he's still funding it. And on Russia, he has actually slapped on some sanctions. So, what's he achieving? He's achieving uh, being president until he's either impeached or jailed. <laughs> no, but on, on the issues, what, 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 isn't it just rhetoric? Isn't that all we're hearing? Well, I think what's very concerning is that the rhetoric is quite so, quite so inflammatory. Um, and, you know, it, it, there are lots of flip-flops. Um, and I think there probably is quite a team of people around him trying to ensure some consistency because, what, what, I mean, he's almost a parody of himself now that, that it almost washes over you like this kind of wave of noise and then, well, we'll actually wait and see what's going to happen. But uh, uh, do, do, I, I still don't think I feel very comfortable with Donald Trump. Do, do you think that at any point, Maeve, there's going to be a point where the public will turn around and say, we've heard all this before, actually, in the grand scheme of things, nothing has really changed. Well, very possibly. I mean, he is, he's been repeating the same mantra, as you say, he's been very repetitive. He's very unpolitically correct, which is strange for us because we're used to so much political correctness. But on foreign affairs and international relations, Donald Trump can really say what he wants because at the end of the day, his voters don't actually care about foreign affairs. It's more things and feeling like there's money in their pockets is why they voted for him. <laughs> Dubbed Birksit by some, it was this photo that captured Europe's attention this morning. The French and German leaders showing a united front at Le Roi d'Espagne bar in Brussels' famous complex. Also present was Belgian Prime Minister Charles Michel and Luxembourg's Xavier Bettel. But as the pair prepare for a no-deal Brexit, was it just an innocent way to relax after tough talks or a public show of solidarity in the face of a Brexit stalemate? One thing certain, Polish Prime Minister Mr. Mateusz Morawiecki wasn't there. He was spotted in Place Jourdain. Nor was Theresa May, who missed out on last night's dinner as well. Okay, was that a PR move? Yeah. Yes, what was very that? clearly. What was the message? Definitely, nothing happens here without being planned. So that is clearly a PR move they are doing to, to show that they are a, a team, like they are strong together. Of course, it was a PR move. Or that, OK, we can't reach a deal, let's just go out for drinks. And I mean, it's not, it may have been a bit of that as well. Maybe they, they were like, oh, finally, we, we're free now, let's go yeah, for a so beer. Yeah, so who are they talking it... to? Who are they showing this to? Well, there's a difference between going for a beer just around the commission and going for a beer on the Grand Place, mm. in the famous Grand Place in Brussels. Right. So obviously that was the PR yeah. move. It was, yeah. we know we're going to be photographed, we know we're going mm. to be seen together, and we might as well so enjoy it. Are, we ta are they talking to the British people? Are they talking to the British government? Are they who were they talking to? What do you to think? everyone. 
Oh, I, I think they had multiple audiences, mm. I, I, no shadow of a doubt. And um, actually part of the audience was one another, telling mm. one another that mm. we are absolutely united yeah. and don't anybody dare try and move away from yeah. this position. Yeah. Let's go to tonight's uh, raw moment. There's been a lot of complicated Brexit talk, as, as you know, recently. But here's one German satirical show explaining the single market. Let's take a look. It's not overdone. Hier, Engländer, die Tante Angela erklärt euch das nochmal wie sehr, sehr doofen Kindern. Aber es gibt eben auch ein paar Maßstäbe. Und einer dieser Maßstäbe ist, dass man nicht zum Binnenmarkt gehören kann, wenn man nicht Teil des Binnenmarktes ist. Ja, genau, Engländer. Nur wenn man im Binnenmarkt ist, ist man im Binnenmarkt. Kapiert? Got it? Komm, ich mach's noch einfacher. Guck mal. Das hier ist meine neue Boris Johnson Sockenpuppe, ne? Guck mal. So. Und das hier ist die EU. Ja? Jetzt ist der Boris drinnen, draußen. Drinnen, draußen. German satire, how was that received there? I thought it was funny. It wasn't raw, it was funny. <laughs> And you quite, you quite like this. You quite like that Boris was a star of this satire. Well, I, I, I love a huge number of things about this, and particularly Germans taking the mickey out of an Englishman like me. I mean, you know, that's a new concept as well. You know, Germans with a sense of humor. And my German friends and family oh, and colleagues go. will forgive me for saying that. <laughs> That was the week that was. Join us again next week on Monday. We'll be live from the European Parliament in Strasbourg. See you then.